So welcome to the 102nd theoretical physics program by Professor Tracy Sletia uh, from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She received her uh, PhD in physics from Harvard University in 2010. After that, she was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies and uh, she became a faculty in 2013 at MIT. Uh, in 2018-19, she was a, a junior visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, over the years, she received many different awards for the research that she's doing, uh, starting from uh, 2014 Bruna Rossi Prize from the American Astronomical Society Early Career Research Award uh, from in 2015. Uh, Henry Primakov Award uh, for Early Career Physic Particle Physics in 2017, a number of other awards. I'll skip. There is a long list, so I'll perhaps mention most uh, recent ones. Um, the New Horizons Prize in uh, uh, Physics from Breakthrough Foundation in 2021 for major contributions to particle astrophysics from models of dark matter to the discovery of the Fermi bubbles. Uh, George Lemaitre Chair uh, Award from UC Louvain in 2021 and Simons Investigator in 2022. She is also involved in uh, professional service. Um, one of the things she's doing right now is a divisional associate editor for physical review letters from 2021. Her research interests include dark matter, model building beyond the standard model, astrophysical and collider signatures of beyond standard model physics, cosmology and the early universe, gamma ray astronomy, field theory, perhaps many other things. And uh, today she will be talking about testing dark matter interactions through cosmic history. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Tracy. Well, um, thanks very much, Igor, and thanks to all of you for coming. I'm happy to be here and to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing. This work is primarily with uh, these postdocs and students, Hongwen Liu, who's currently a postdoc at NYU in Princeton after doing his PhD at MIT. Uh, Greg Ridgway, who's my former student who just graduated and went into the tech industry, and Wenzhou Kian and Yutian Sun, who are our current students. All right, so what I want to do today is start out by just talking a little bit about the puzzle of dark matter. I know that this is a broad audience. I spend most of my time thinking about dark matter, but not everyone here does. So I want to say a little bit about, you know, what the, what the questions are and uh, how we might go after them. Then I want to talk about one particular way of going after dark matter, which is by looking at its potential effects on how the early universe evolved. And so I want to say a bit about some observational windows on cosmic history from the cosmic microwave background to the Lyman Alpha Forest to the primordial 21 centimeter radiation. And then I want to talk to you about how a fairly generic possibility, which is that if dark matter could, can convert its mass into standard model particles via annihilation or decay or similar processes, how that kind of exotic energy injection could modify the early universe. And we'll go through just some back of the envelope estimates for how big this effect might be, what kind of changes you might expect. So you can see you know, what is the physics behind the kind of signatures that you might want to observe. And then um, in the last part of the talk, I'll go into the beyond the back of the envelope calculation of how, how you actually do this if you want to work out the signatures in detail, and then talk about some recent upcoming developments in that regard, including um, neural networks to try to improve the signal calculation and recent improvements to the calculation that will allow us to predict uh, new observable quantities and potentially uh, figure out the sensitivities of new and upcoming experiments. So as was already said, please feel free to ask questions as I go. I may try to pause a couple of times just for ask for, to ask for questions. If I'm going way too slowly and everything's you know, too, too easy, feel free. I'm happy to go into more detail if people want to follow ups. If on the other hand, I'm going too fast and things are confusing, please speak up and tell me to, and, and I'm happy to expand. Okay, so but let's just begin by talking about dark matter and what we mean by dark matter. So we think we know that there's a component to the universe that doesn't scatter, emit, or absorb light at a level that we have yet detected, but it does have mass and hence gravitates. And we call that component dark matter, where dark means the first bit doesn't scatter, emit, or absorb light, or the really transparent matter might be a better word. Um, but, and the second part, the matter just means it has mass, it appears to behave like non-relativistic matter, it has that equation of state, and everything that we've learned about it, more or less, we've learned by its gravitational pull on ordinary matter. 
this, it now, of course, there could be something more complicated going on, but the existence of such a component seems to be a simple hypothesis that explains a lot of astrophysical and cosmological data. We think we have an estimate of how much of this stuff there is for measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which I'll talk more about um, shortly. We think it's about 84% of all the matter in the universe. And we have, we can do both pretty good theoretical predictions for how it should be distributed throughout the universe. And our current understanding of cosmology says that this stuff forms the primordial scaffolding for the visible universe. So these plots on the right are simulations, not done by my group, but done by the Illustris collaboration, which includes some of my MIT colleagues, where we're going from early times at the bottom of the page to late times at the top of the page. And the left panels are showing how the dark matter is distributed, and the right panels are showing how the visible gas is distributed. So the picture here is that as the universe expands and as time goes on, dark matter forms this filamentary web-like structure and which grows in density over time. And eventually you have these high density nodes of dark matter, the intersections of this cosmic web. And just through gravity, those regions of high dark matter density attract visible matter onto it. The dark matter is much more abundant than the visible matter. So from a gravitational perspective, it's most of what's going on in the universe. When the visible matter is attracted into these high density dark matter regions, that leads to high gas densities in which stars can form and which eventually galaxies can form. So in this picture, the high density dark matter regions are the nurseries of galaxies. And so from that, you might expect, all right, galaxies will generally be surrounded by halos of dark matter because that's what causes galaxies in the first place. That's where galaxies are born. And this is a bit of an ahistorical presentation because one of the first things that we learned about dark matter, one of our first clues to its existence, was indeed that there appear to be large clouds or halos of some invisible matter around most of the galaxies that we observe. And this was measured back in the 1970s from looking at orbital velocities of stars and gas clouds and looking at how that velocity fell off as you move away from the center of the galaxy was suggestive that, you know, that this is a cartoon, but in addition to the bright part of galaxies like the Milky Way that we inhabit, they are, there is a, the, the actual extension in terms of their mass density and their gravitational effect is much greater. And so we say the galaxies are surrounded by dark matter halos. So all of these statements are positive statements about you know, how dark matter behaves, about how much of the universe is, about how it's distributed, but there's also a really important negative statement, which is that if dark matter interacts with other particles through mechanisms other than through gravity, it does so weakly or not at all. And that statement comes from the fact that we've been looking for non-gravitational interactions of dark matter for a really long time. And so far, there are no compelling positive results. That there are some hints of things that might be positive results, and that's a different colloquium, which, and I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that if people are interested. But so far at the moment, I would say like there are no there are no confirmed signals, um, no, no signals that would let you get particularly close to saying, all right, we've discovered non-gravitational interactions of dark matter. So that lets us set pretty stringent upper limits. Now, those pieces of information are enough on their own to tell us that we cannot explain dark matter with just the physics that we currently understand. Um, the, you, you know, within the standard model, if you think about particles, Neutrinos might look like a dark matter candidate, they're neutral, they're stable, but neutrinos are too light and too fast moving to form that filamentary cosmic web that I talked about, which is essential to our understanding of how galaxies form. Um, it's possible that dark matter could be made of tiny black holes left over from the early universe, but in that case there needs to be some physics we don't currently understand in the early universe to make those primordial black holes in the first place. Um, you know, it's that there have been some discussions about maybe dark matter could be some kind of like exotic bound state of standard model particles. Okay, but then there's still physics that we don't currently understand in the properties of those objects. So I, I think, you know, I think this is a safe statement, like within the physics that we think we currently have a handle on, we don't have an explanation for what dark matter is. So that leaves a lot of open questions with the big one being what is this stuff? How does it and you know, how does it behave? And you can subdivide that into many other questions. Like, what are, what are we looking at here? Are we looking at one kind of inert new particle? Are we looking at a whole forest of new particles? Are we looking at something that we might not usually think of as a particle at all, like tiny black holes left over from the early universe? Where did it come from? Like, where is this, where did this 84% number get set? Is that determined through some interaction with the visible particles? Is it just some initial condition? Is there some dynamical mechanism that generates it? You know, what, why is it 84%?
and doesn't interact with ordinary particles other than through gravity. You know, we haven't detected those interactions yet. That doesn't mean they don't exist. If so, you know, what's the nature of those interactions and how can we learn about them? And I could keep asking questions like this for quite a long time. So when faced with these questions, of course, as theorists, we immediately start to think about, OK, like what, what are some possibilities for what dark matter might be? And the thing with dark matter physics is that the problem is not that we don't have ideas. We have lots of ideas. So this is a cartoon figure from the last snow mass community planning process that the particle physics community underwent um, almost a decade ago, back in 2013. And I don't want to explain everything on this plot, so I'll just give you the basic takeaway messages. Everything within this solid red line is meant to be a class of theories for what dark matter could be. Everything outside the solid red line is a larger problem in particle physics to which these dark matter ideas might connect. So for example, dark matter could be related to new symmetries of the universe, such as supersymmetry. It could be related to extra dimensions. It could give us insight into puzzles of the Higgs sector, or the um, or QCD, the strong sector of the standard model. It could have something to do with the neutrino sector. It could have some kind of be some kind of heavy sterile neutrino. Dark matter could also inhabit its own dark sector and experience forces that we don't know about yet. In the same way that the standard model feels electromagnetism, and dark matter apparently does not. In which case, dark matter might be like our our easiest window onto what's going on with new forces of nature, and a whole new dark sector. So. So there's, there's a ton of possibilities and understanding what dark matter is, in addition to just answering the question of what is 84% of the matter in the universe, could potentially provide a key to other puzzles in theoretical physics. Um, at the same time, every possibility, every class of scenarios on this figure is currently consistent with the experimental evidence that I have told you about. All of these scenarios have regions of parameter space where the interactions are weak enough that we wouldn't have seen them yet. All of them can give rise to non-relativistic, mostly gravitationally interacting matter that is sufficiently cold and sufficiently heavy in, in the present day. So yeah, our problem is not a lack of solutions to this problem. Our problem is that there are a lot of solutions and probably at most one of the ones on this figure is the answer to what is the bulk of the dark matter in the universe. At, at most one, it might be that none of these are, are the right answer. So how might we try to distinguish these? Well, the, the answer that the community has had and has been pursuing for many years is it would be great if we could find non-gravitational signatures of dark matter, if we could really probe its interactions with visible particles or with other dark matter particles, which would allow us to start, um, you know, to, to, to start actually you know, identifying the dark matter properties beyond what we currently know. And so there's a large multifaceted search program for signatures of dark matter. And the kind of standard classic classification of that search program is to basically draw some simple toy Feynman diagrams and say, let's rotate the Feynman diagram and think about different ways that we might look for this interaction. So schematically, this separation says, all right, we can think about cases where if two dark matter, if dark matter particles collide with each other producing visible matter, we could measure the visible matter and try to figure out what's going on in this blob, in this interaction between dark matter and visible particles. Or you could have a situation where dark matter bounces off visible particles by measuring, again, the recoils of the visible particles. You could try to figure out what's going on in this blob, on this other side. And we call these indirect detection and direct detection, respectively, because in indirect detection, you're typically looking for these particles from an interaction that happened way out in space. Um, in direct detection, you're hoping the interaction actually happens within your lab, which you measure by seeing the recoils. Or we can flip the diagram around completely and look for um, if we crash standard model particles together at accelerators, maybe dark matter could be produced among the products and we could see it as, um, as missing energy. So these are sort of the classic indirect direct detection and accelerator searches for dark matter. And the uh, mnemonic for these is you can break it, shake it, or make it. But this isn't an exhaustive list. And one of the big developments over the last 10 years has been the realization of the degree to which this is not an exhaustive list. There are lots of other signatures that you might look for. Uh, for very light dark matter, such as axion candidates, it can be possible for dark matter to oscillate into standard model particles, such as photons. There are, but again, for very light dark matter, you can potentially get absorption signatures in where, where the dark matter bounces off a standard model particle, but the interaction is inelastic. The dark matter particle can end up you know, getting, getting bound or absorbed by the standard model particle. And, you know, and, and there's a wider range of possibilities here. 
And many of these possible interactions, and, and there are also possibilities like maybe there aren't just two particles in the initial state for these indirect detection signals. You, you can have multi-body interactions in the scattering case. You often have to think carefully about collective effects on the standard model side of the diagram. If the dark matter does interact with new particles as well, like new force carriers, new mediators, you can look for those mediators in accelerator searches. It doesn't have to be just the dark matter that you look for. And in some cases, it's easier to find other particles because they may not be stable. They may decay away within your accelerator and give you interesting signatures. So over the last 10 years in particular, there's been a great deal of attention both to pushing this program forward and to going beyond this program. And but the thing that I want to focus on in this talk is that many of these interaction structures uh, can, many of these possible interaction structures can also be, can be tested with cosmological and astrophysical observables. So this is just one slice of a big multifaceted research program, but it's the one that I'm going to focus on today. So I just want to say a little bit, we just went through the SNOMAS uh, community planning process for particle physics. And so this is a cartoon from the recent SNOMAS conference in July 2022. And this is just kind of a sketch of cosmic frontier probes of dark matter in which we include indirect detection and direct detection, but also just more generally how looking at how better understanding astrophysical and cosmological systems can allow us to prove what dark matter is doing. So this is a very telegraphic cartoon of the dark matter parameter space where the mass of the dark matter is on the x-axis and its sort of interaction strength with standard model particles is on the y-axis and green bits of this cartoon indicate constraints that we have from astrophysical and cosmological probes of dark matter, which allow us to say that the dark matter can't be too light or its Debrelli wavelength would be large enough to disrupt galaxies. It can't be too heavy or we would you know, have already seen it in gravitational lensing probes, and it can't be too strongly interacting, or it would have disrupted the history of the universe and the properties of dark matter halos, some of which in ways that I will, I will talk to you about in a moment. But then additionally, we have dedicated searches for axion dark matter and for scattering of dark matter, which have started carving into this theoretically motivated parameter space but there are a lot of possibilities out there spanning from very, very tiny mass scales, 20 orders of magnitude lighter than the neutrino. The, the, astro, the astrophysical lower bound on the dark matter mass is about 10 to the minus 21 EV, up to possibilities like macroscopic dark matter and primordial black holes. So there's a lot to do. But over, over the next 10 years, all of these constraints are going to get better. The astrophysical and cosmological constraints will sort of compress the parameter space from the sides and above. And these dedicated searches for the QCD axion parameter space is going to be probed over an enormous range over the last decade. It will release there are experiments that are capable of doing that if they get the funding. And similarly, we'll be carving much deeper into the parameter space for some theoretically motivated particle like dark matter candidate. So that's just my little adver advertisement for the field is great. We have lots of ideas to go for how to go after this stuff. And the synergy between terrestrial searches for dark matter like these axion and WIMP searches that can test really tiny cross sections for specific models are complemented by these astrophysical and cosmological searches that kind of look for dark matter in its natural environment and can tell us a lot about its more general properties. So the way that I would summarize the overall situation is there's an enormous range of possible dark matter scenarios that span many tens of orders of magnitude and mass. And many of those scenarios are pretty close to each other from the perspective of gravitational effects. There are exceptions to this. Again, if the dark matter is really light or really heavy, you can maybe tell just from gravitational probes that that's going on. If it's strongly self-interacting, that will disrupt that cosmic web I told you about, similarly if it's sufficiently fast moving. So we do have some things we can learn about dark matter and some things we have already learned about dark matter just from looking at, at how it's distributed through the universe. But in principle, non-gravitational interactions would provide much greater discriminating power, and we would really love to be able to see non-gravitational interactions between dark matter and the standard model. There's a large ongoing experimental program to search for such interactions. But if such interactions existed, one generic way to think about them is that they provide a way to transfer energy between the energy stored in the mass of the dark matter and the standard model particles that we can actually see. So then you can ask the generic question, all right, if I've got a way to move energy between the dark sectors and the visible sectors, what does that do to early universe cosmology? And those interactions could be either some kind of elastic interaction, like just the dark matter and the standard model scatter off each other, that transfers heat back and forth, or they could be inelastic, where you're actually taking the mass, the energy stored in the mass of the dark matter and making standard model particles from it. And the latter is going to be the focus of this talk. 
So what I'm going to tell you for the rest of this talk is, all right, let's now imagine some generic interaction structures. Dark matter mass gets converted to visible particles over the age of the universe. From the perspective of the standard model, there's been a trickle of energy coming apparently from nowhere, but really from the dark matter over the whole history of the cosmos. What does that do? How does that change observables? How can we look? Okay, so that's um, right. So that's the introduction. So that's my sort of general picture of the status of dark matter in the field, where we're going. Uh, now I'm going to show you this particular class of things. So I guess are there any questions at this point before I go on? Um, may I ask you a simple question? Uh, yeah. You distinguish somehow like wave-like uh, dark matter from bosonic yeah. matter. What's what's the specifics of wave-like? Okay, good. Yeah. So this was this is partly a division that we made for snow mass, and the exact boundary is a little bit artificial. But once the dot right, so this is primarily, I would say, an experimental distinction. Like, of course, as theorists, everything's a particle and everything's a wave to a first approximation. But for experimentalists, you care about whether the wavelength of the particle is bigger than your experiment or not. Um, it changes what kind of search you need to do. If the wavelength of the particle is extremely tiny compared to your experiment, you can basically think of it the problem as I have a very weakly interacting billiard ball that is going to interact with my experiment. How can I how can I detect a very weakly interacting, very tiny billiard ball hitting my experiment? And so so then you end up looking, uh, you, you, you look a lot for, for scattering searches, you maybe look for absorption searches, but you think of it as a particle comes in, bounces off your experiment, and you design your experiment to look for that. Um, on the other hand, if the dark matter's wavelength is significantly large compared to your experiment, and you really can't treat it like a classical particle anymore, it's often more appropriate to think about the effect of the dark matter as like being some coherent field or being some modification to the equate to Maxwell's equations, for example. And so then that gives you a new set of signatures that you can possibly look for. Like some of these QCD axion search experiments, the ones that are hoping to really like probe the whole range, basically what their signature is, is that Maxwell's equations have an extra term because there's this coherently oscillating axion field that couples to the photon and, and, and leads to situations where you get induced currents or induced magnetic fields where from the standard model alone, you would not expect them. So for the purposes of snow mass, they made us split into wave-like dark matter searches and particle-like dark matter searches because of different communities working on that. And we had to pick a boundary line between these and we very arbitrarily picked 1 EV. Um, but, 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 that, but that's super arbitrary. But, but if you ask sort of for the for dark matter in the halo, what is what corresponds to sort of like a meter scale de Broglie wavelength, it's like somewhere between the milli EV and the EV. Scale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds so that's good. That's the reason for that. But like from a theory perspective, yeah, everything's okay. a particle. Everything's. A particle. Uh, there is another question apparently from the audience. Uh, Henry Dijon, please ask if you have. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Maybe naive, but uh, on your previous uh, slides, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple before this, you had the different theories of dark. Yeah, right here. Yep. Uh, some of the outline ones and so forth all indicate or at least touch on different types of physics. But I guess fundamentally, what's your take on our understanding of gravity uh, as it is now, uh, as we know it now, to, in in a basic level, on a fundamental level, to begin with. Um. Yeah. Like you're. So. So I. I guess there are. I mean, I. I think that we don't understand how gravity behaves very well in the region in the regime of like very strong gravity and very high energies. I mean, I have colleagues who spend a lot of their time thinking about quantum gravity. There may be people in Zoom who think a lot about quantum gravity and at least my understanding is I don't think we understand this very well I think there's really interesting work going on in how to think about what properties a theory of quantum gravity might have and how that might impact our understanding of, of low energy physics I mean you know, I haven't talked about dark energy here aka the cosmological constant problem I haven't talked you know so I, I mean I, I think there are certainly things that we don't understand about gravity at the same time, when we think about dark matter, we're really thinking about infrared effects, like the, the scales on which we observe effects that we associated with that we associate with dark matter are enormous, like the galaxy scale up to you know the order of the horizon scale of the universe. And in that regime, all the tests that we have of general relativity look really good like modifications to general relativity are pretty strongly constrained and the experience on the dark on, on the dark matter side has been that 
every time we've been like, oh, maybe our simple theory of dark matter doesn't work very well in explaining properties of galaxies, as soon as we put in like more complex and accurate models of galaxies, like allow them to actually have visible matter in them, not just dark matter, then the results have gotten closer to the observations. So, and, and on the large scales where we expect, um, you know, physics to be relatively linear and simple, it, like again, the predictions look really good. It only gets complicated when you start getting into regimes where you might legitimately worry that things like, so how exactly do you model supernova explosions and their effect on the gas distribution start to become important? That's the place, that's sort of the region where there are still maybe some discrepancies between the simple dark matter model and the simulations. But it, it's hard to convince myself, at least, that that's due to like something we don't understand about dark matter as opposed, or, or whatever is the proxy for what we are calling dark matter as opposed to something that we don't understand about baryons. But so, so yeah, so I guess my feeling is, yeah, we definitely don't fully understand gravity, but we might understand gravity in the IR. And I mean, at, at some level, you know, of course people spend a lot of time thinking about possible theories of modified gravity in the IR as a substitute for these dark matter results. And in some sense to me as a theorist, I think it would be more interesting if, if that was the truth. Like in some ways, dark matter is sort of the boring hypothesis. It's like, oh, you know, there's one extra particle that we haven't found yet that, you know, that we haven't positively identified in the universe yet, but otherwise it just behaves like ordinary matter in every way. I mean, obviously I say relatively boring, like I still think this is a cool problem. I think it, you know, could teach us a lot about fundamental physics, but I mean, in, in some ways it's kind of the Occam's razor option that just saying that, okay, that there's, there's some extra component that has an equation of state just like regular matter can explain a huge range of observations, but yeah, so so I guess that's my that's my feeling on trying to explain it, and you know, just like could, could this be telling us about a lack of our understanding of gravity? Like it would be great if it could, but it's also true that most of these observations are like very very deep in the IR, and the places where I think we're pretty sure we don't understand something about gravity are, are in the UV. Interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, then if there are no more questions, let me go. Well, let me let me see if my screen is sorry, gonna actually cooperate. Let me go on to talking about right, how do you so how do you look for this trickle of energy transfer between the two sectors? So let's think about some generic interaction structures which could which I'm just going to use as examples, but you know, hopefully once we go through the back of the envelope estimates, you'll see how you can extend this to like any kind of mechanism that you have that transfers energy from the dark sector into the visible sector. So, okay, so a very classic interaction structure that people uh, talk about very commonly for astrophysical or cosmological signatures of dark matter is the possibility of annihilation. So the picture here is that just as matter and antimatter can annihilate, when two dark matter particles crash together, maybe some new physics occurs, this thing in the question mark, this is the a miracle occurs step, this is the thing that we would like to probe experimentally, and producing standard model particles. I've drawn it as two to two here, it doesn't need to be two to two necessarily. Um, but usually if there is a two to two process, it will tend to dominate in the late universe over you know, initial three body or four body states, just at least if the dark matter is sort of in the particle-like regime rather than the ultralight wave-like regime, just because its occupation number then tends to be rather small. So I'll focus on the case where there are two dark matter particles in the initial state. So if that process produces standard model particles, they could in principle be anything in the standard model, quarks, leptons, gauge bosons, etc. And we know how standard model particles behave. Most of them are unstable. They will promptly, you know, hadronize if they're strongly interacting and then decay into long-lived standard model particles. So the end point of this process is going to be a, a bunch of spectra of long-lived standard model particles, such as photons, electrons, positrons, neutrinos, antineutrinos, protons, antiprotons etc. Maybe a small amount of uh, nuclei and antinuclei. And there's an enormous range of searches for looking for these decay, looking for these annihilation products coming from regions of high dark matter density. I can talk about that more separately if people are interested as well. So this annihilation process, there is a convenient benchmark for it in the, in a in the class of scenarios where the dark matter was once in thermal equilibrium with the standard model, this annihilation process can actually be what determines the amount of dark matter in the present day where the short version of the story is just there was lots more dark matter early on, this annihilation process destroyed almost all of it, the residual amount that is left over depends on when this annihilation process becomes inefficient relative to the expansion of the universe, and hence mostly just depends on the strength 
of this annihilation process. Now that's not a guarantee. Dark matter could be produced in a different way. It could get its abundance in a different way. But this is like a very simple, not UV sensitive class of scenarios that gets you the right dark matter abundance with an interaction cross section that is sort of in the ballpark of weak scale physics. So that's called the wind miracle and it's been a popular way of getting the right dark matter abundance for a long time as a result. So the, the cross section that you need to have that story work is parametrically one over the Planck mass times the temperature of matter radiation equality um, corresponds to a scale of about 100 TeV, or if I put it into not into more astrophysicist friendly units, this corresponds to about two times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cube per second. So when I talk about like the thermal relic cross section or the thermal relic benchmark in later slides, this is what I mean. Again, it's not a guarantee, but if you were to see a signal with a cross section like this, you would also have a pretty simple explanation for why we see the amount of dark matter we do. Another pretty generic interaction structure is that the dark matter will just decay. Like it has to have a lifetime longer than the age of the universe because we still see a lot of dark matter around today. And we have measurements of how much of it there was at redshift you know, when the universe was only 400,000 years old that are pretty consistent with the amount we see today. Um, so we can't have, so it should have a pretty long lifetime, but um, it, as we'll see later from these back of the envelope estimates, lifetimes 10 orders of magnitude eight longer than the age of the universe can still have observable signals. So, so that's, that's like the preview. So in this picture, it's similar to annihilation, except you've got just one particle in the initial state rather than the two. So everything else is the same. Dark matter decays, produces standard model particles. You look for the long-lived particles that result as a decay of the initial, uh, that result from the decay of the initial decay products. And I've drawn this here like the whole dark matter particle is decaying, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true. So for example, primordial black holes, if they're sufficiently light, evaporate away by a Hawking radiation, that's a decay process for the purposes of what I'm talking about, you know, because mass stored in the black, dark matter in the black holes is getting converted into visible radiation. So, um, so yeah, so we'll use annihilation to talk about any case where two dark matter particles come together and inject energy and decay to mean any process where one dark matter particle injects energy. So either annihilation or decay would lead to a slow trickle of energy into the visible sector of the universe's standard model over time, and we can explore the effects of that energy transfer on the history of the universe. So to do that, let's talk a little bit just about what our observables are from the early universe. So the cosmic microwave background radiation is the earliest direct light that we observe from the early universe. It was emitted when the universe was about 400,000 years old, which corresponds to a redshift factor of about a thousand. So redshift factor is just how much the universe has expanded since that time. So this is the universe was linearly about a factor of a thousand smaller. So why is redshift a thousand a special time or 400,000 years in age? So before then, the universe was filled with a tightly coupled plasma of electrons, protons, and photons, and neutrinos, and we think also dark matter. It was basically 100% ionized because at that point, the universe was sufficiently compressed that its temperature was high enough to maintain this ionized plasma. But around redshift 1000, the universe expanded to the point that the temperature of that plasma was no longer high enough to keep the hydrogen in an ionized state. And so the ionization level dropped abruptly, the electrons and protons started finding each other and binding into hydrogen and not being efficiently dissociated. And because photons love to scatter off electrically charged particles, but not off electrically neutral particles, the CMB photons at that point began to stream free. So the CMB photons are just the photons that were around at that time in the universe. They had been bouncing off the charged particles. Once all the charged particles ended up in hydrogen, the photons just free streamed. And most of those photons, the next time they scattered off anything, was, well, the ones we see the next time they scattered off anything was when they hit our telescopes, you know, 14 billion years later. So this gives us a direct snapshot of what the universe looked like at a very early stage in its history. And we can measure this light and we can look at the spatial distribution of this light across the sky. So this is an image from the Planck telescope because we've probably seen things like this before that show, you know, hot and cold spots on the sky. So this is showing the um, fluctuations in the light from that early time. And you can also look at energy information. So this is the measurement of the energy spectrum, which we did back around 1990. and haven't done since, actually. More recent CMB telescopes are not sensitive to the energy spectrum of the monopole. This is a really perfect black body. These data points on this plot are 400 sigma error bars. So this is a really well-measured black body with a temperature of about 2.725. Kelvin and the deviations are at less than the 10 to the minus five level. So we can ask how energy injection into the early universe could change either this spatial information or the spectral information. So there are basically, one way that I think about is there are basically two ways to modify this um, observed cosmic microwave background. 
either, so this is, this is like a snapshot. This is like a picture with your camera. So you want to modify a photo in your camera, you can either change what the photo was taken on, like tell people to move around, tell people to smile, etc. So this is like, we can modify the target of the snapshot. If there are changes to the plasma and changes to the behavior of the universe before Redshift 1000, then that will modify the information in the CMB just because we, we're changing the target of the snapshot. Um, after Redshift 1000, the snapshot has already been taken. So now if we want to modify what we see in the CMB, we have to do some, you know, call it a Photoshop thing after the fact. So we change, so we can change the photons on their way to us. So new physics that does either of these things will potentially leave observable signatures in the CMB. The classic example of the first case is just the, the presence of dark matter at all. The temperature and density oscillations in that early plasma are driven by a competition between gravity and radiation pressure. So and high density regions tend to collapse under gravity, but if those high density regions are made out of gas that also experiences radiation pressure, the radiation pressure will provide a restoring force that pushes it back out. So this is just the physics of a force down harmonic oscillator. Um, but the, the relative strength of the gravity and radiation pressure determines the properties of the oscillations. So if we have matter in this plasma that feels gravity, but doesn't feel any radiation pressure, which is dark matter, like that's in some ways just the definition of dark matter, then it will change the properties of those oscillations. And this is how we get that 84% number in the first place. We're basically just measuring how strong is gravity relative to radiation pressure at first order at the time of the CMB. And these plots here are from an old paper that is just showing the effect of that, of changing the total amount of ordinary baryonic matter, by which we mean all the standard model matter in the CMB, and changing the amount of total matter by adding more dark matter. These, the y-axis here is just the, is, is basically the power in fluctuations at a given scale, and the x-axis is what scale we're looking at. So this is like a power spectrum. So that's, okay. So, so that's an example of the first type of modification. If we had some kind of like scattering between dark matter and ordinary matter, it means that the dark matter is not quite dark anymore. It feels a little bit of the radiation pressure. And so that modifies the oscillation pattern. Um, similarly, if we heat the ordinary matter before, recom before this recombination period, that can also modify the plasma and that can change the black body spectrum of the CMB. So, these sort of like early changes to the CMB can potentially modify, you know, both its anisotropy pattern and, and the energy spectrum. But some of the strongest constraints today come from the second case where we're modifying things after emission. So what happens after the CMB is released? Well, I've told you that the universe becomes, is mostly neutral hydrogen and helium. At this point, the photons are just pre-streaming towards our telescopes. So this is a picture of the CMB. So this is the epoch called the Cosmic Dark Ages, which extends down to about redshift 30 when the first stars start to turn on. The ionization level of the universe is very low during this period. So if we cause extra ionization, so you know, photons just free stream, so the, the zeroth order picture, the photons just free stream through the universe and eventually meet our telescopes, like, like telescope here. And so, but if we produce extra ionization during this period, we're producing extra free electrons that these CMB photons can scatter off. So anything that makes extra ionization of the hydrogen gas during this period essentially sets up a screen for the CMB photons. Um, and that can modify, uh, that can modify the CMB anisotropies, so the spatial distribution, but basically by scattering those photons. And um, Annihilation decay could also produce extra low energy photons, which just add directly onto the CMB energy spectrum. So again, by measuring that black body spectrum, we can also set constraints on production of additional photons after the CMB is released. So this cosmic dark ages period occurs between when the universe was you know, about 400,000 years old, as I said, and about 100 million years old. And this will be the source of some pretty sensitive constraints. Now, if we go to even later times, so I said, you know, at, at about Regia 30, the first stars just start to turn on. So what happens then? So it will turn out that once we get into that epoch, we have the potential to start measuring the temperature of the universe, which the, uh, well, and in particular, the temperature of the gas of the universe, which the CMB is not very sensitive to once it's emitted. You know, like once the CMB is decoupled from the gas, it doesn't really care what the temperature of the gas is doing. But this can become an interesting observable. And so to look at the gas temperature, we can search for atomic transition lines. And in particular, the 21 centimeter spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen is, is a major experimental target. So the picture here is just, we can say that the gas has some spin temperature, which tells us how much of the gas is in the excited state versus ground state of this transition. What, like, if I tell you that I have a spin temperature of 40 Kelvin, that tells me that the relative abundances in the ground state and excited state are what I would expect from a thermal population at 40 Kelvin. 
So if the spin temperature exceeds the ambient radiation temperature, then there'll be net, um, then there'll be net emission. We'll have lots of particles in the excited state, which want to decay to the ground state and make emission lines. Um, if the opposite is true, if the spin temperature is below the ambient radiation temperature, we'll primarily get excitation at this transition, and so we'll see absorption lines instead. So by looking for these redshifted emission or absorption lines, we can try to get a measurement of um, how the gas temperature was behaving at early times. So if we ask what is the expected behavior of, of this, this is a picture from uh, Valdez et al. in 2013, just showing the expected um, absorption and emission signatures in 21 centimeter as a function of redshift. So I said around redshift 30 is when the first stars turn on. So why is the first stars turning on important? Um, because before then, you can get a situation where the spin temperature of the gas is actually more closely coupled to the radiation temperature than it is to the actual kinetic temperature of the gas. And so if that's the case, then you're not going to get any 21 centimeter signal. The absorption and emission will cancel each other if the spin temperature matches the radiation temperature. But when the first stars turn on, that produces a flux of photons that allow the spin temperature of the gas to get efficiently coupled to just its kinetic temperature. So, um, so then if the kinetic temperature of the gas deviates from the temperature of the radiation, you can expect to see a signal. So the expected signal is that you start off with an absorption signal, which is these red and yellow signatures from redshifts from about uh, 16 to 25. And then at some point there's a transition and the line moves into emission. And what's causing this physically is that initially we expect the gas to be colder than the radiation bar. The reason for that is that Early in the universe, the gas and the radiation are tightly coupled to each other. So this plot here is showing the black dash line is the radiation temperature and the blue line is the gas temperature in the absence of any heating. Sufficiently early on, they're really closely coupled. But as the universe expands, eventually the, their temperatures will decouple and then non-relativistic particles cool faster than relativistic particles because their momentum redshifts with the expansion of the universe. But for non-relativistic particles, energy goes like momentum squared. And for relativistic particles, it just goes like one power of momentum. So just by the expansion of the universe, we expect the gas to cool faster than the CMB. And so then we get this absorption that is driven by the difference between these temperatures. So the CMB is the backlight here. CMB is providing the radiation. Um, the spectral lines are telling us about how hot or cold the gas is relative to that. So why, so okay, so that's the absorption signature. So the expected emission signature comes from, well, when the stars are turning on, they're producing a lot of radiation and that can heat up the gas. So eventually we expect the gas to actually get hotter than the CMB just because there are these other radiation fields from the stars, they're heating them up. But this is all hypothetical. This is all a theoretical prediction. We don't have any established measurement of the primordial 21 centimeter radiation although there are a number of current and future telescopes who have been setting upper limits on it and, uh, and, and are pushing hard to get a detection which is hoped for within the next few years. So this would give us an entirely new window on the universe between about like redshift 10 and redshift 30. We just don't really know what the temperature of the universe was during that epoch this time. Um, although, you know, Telescopes like JWST that probe the earliest galaxies give us another independent handle on this epoch, which is really cool and, um, and maybe will tell us something interesting. But at the moment, this is, this is kind of an unknown frontier. We don't know what we're going to find when we do this, but we have the hope of being able to get direct observational measurements of the gas temperature in this epoch um, in the next few years. So that would allow, so at that point, any trickle of energy that heats up the gas beyond what you expect could potentially be observable. In this channel. So what can we do right now though? Like, I mean, I just told you, okay, we don't have this yet. What can we do right now? So we have observations of spectral lines from somewhat lower redshift, so later times when the universe has expanded more. So around about, so you, the other thing you can see here is the 21 centimeter line just completely dies off after about our redshift nine. So what's happening there? Well, at redshift around this epoch, and again, this is a theoretical prediction, we expect that there's enough radiation from the stars to reionize the universe. And so the universe goes from being mostly neutral hydrogen to being um, mostly ionized plasma again. And so that epoch we call reionization. Some of the preliminary JWST results suggest that maybe this was a bit more complicated than we thought, that maybe there was sort of multiple reionization phases. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to assume there was one reionization for the moment. But there are some really recent results that are interesting in that regard. So, okay, so then you have no more neutral hydrogen. 
you say. So how am I going to look for spectral you know, emission or absorption lines? Well, after the universe mostly ionizes, there are still clouds of neutral hydrogen in the universe and light passing through those clouds produces what we call the Lyman alpha forest of absorption features in the spectrum. So I have this nice movie from Andrew Ponson, which is going to sort of mock up as you, you know, your observer sort of travels through these filamentary gas clouds in the early universe. Every time it hits a gas cloud of neutral hydrogen, there can be absorption lines associated with them. Um, with uh, the Lyman alpha line and with uh, and, and just with hydrogen and atomic transitions. Now these clouds are filamentary, so you'll be moving in and out of clouds. So you'll get these sort of narrow line structures corresponding to how big the cloud is. And then as the universe continues to expand, these lines will get redshifted, will get stretched along a wavelength and go down to lower energy. So what you see in the present day is this forest of lines that tells you something about what was the distribution of hydrogen clouds as a function of redshift. So the temperature of the gas affects this, these line signatures in a couple of different ways. Um, it affects the, it, it's not so much just determining like the, the strength of the emission as it was in the 21 centimeter case, because this transition is a lot stronger. Like if you hit a hydrogen cloud, you sometimes just absorb all the CMB in that frequency. But the temperature of the gas affects the width of the absorption feature just via the Doppler effect. You know, if the hydrogen atoms are go, uh, whizzing around very quickly, then there's, uh, then there's a Doppler barometer to their absorption features. And the temperature also affects the distribution of the hydrogen gas. Like it changes how puffy those hydrogen clouds are, which again, you can measure from the Lyman alpha forest. So this is a somewhat more difficult calculation than the 21 centimeter one that I just sketched for you. So in this case, what people do is they build simulations of what the Lyman alpha forest should look like under different assumptions about the temperature and use that to infer the temperature during this epoch. And so there have been several recent studies, and this is a plot from one of them, them that use this to try to measure the temperature of the universe um, dur during this epoch, where the universe was sort of around. So this is where the universe was around a billion to a couple of billion years old. And so these are these are the data points. Uh, you'll note the y-axis here is in 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So this corresponds to temperatures around 10,000 Kelvin. And the error bars are also kind of large. Just for comparison, prior to reionization, prior to the stars turning on, the, um, the y-axis on this plot is like single digits of Kelvin. So we'll see that 21 centimeter could be a lot more sensitive than Lyman alpha. And part of it is just being able to measure the temperature of the universe before the stars do their thing and heat everything up. But a sufficiently large heating from dark matter might still be observable on top of this astrophysical background. Okay, so those are the observables that I want to tell you about. We can measure the temperature of the universe at redshift two to six now. In the future, we might be able to measure the temperature of the universe at redshift 10 to 30 before the stars heated everything up. And already we can do sensitive measurements of the ionization history of the universe during the cosmic dark ages. So let's now do my promise back of the envelope estimates and figure what kind of signals we might be able to see. Okay, so I want to know what fraction of the dark matter do I need to convert into energy to be able to do something interesting to the hydrogen ionization fraction. So let me first ask, all right, how much of the baryonic matter would I need to convert into energy to do something interesting, the hydrogen ionization fraction? So a hydrogen atom weighs about 1 GeV, but its ionization potential is 13.6 GeV. So that means that if I were to take 10 to the minus 8 of the hydrogen in the universe, and convert it into energy, that would be enough energy to ionize 100% of the remaining hydrogen. Now there's five times as much energy in dark matter mass compared to baryonic matter mass. So that tells me that if I were to take one in a billion dark matter particles and cause it to annihilate or decay, that's enough power to ionize half the hydrogen in the universe. Now, it would be really obvious in the CMB if half the hydrogen in the universe had gotten ionized during the cosmic dark ages. In fact, those measurements are so good that we can look, that we can detect um, order one changes to the expected ionization level, which is about 10 to the minus four. So, you know, I, and when I first realized this, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Our measurements are so good that we could tell if one in a thousand hydrogen atoms was ionized when the universe was a million years old, which um, is, is quite amazing to me. But okay, so this tells us one in a billion dark matter particles annihilating or decaying should be a huge signal. Um, you know, even like one in 10 to the 12 dark matter particles annihilating or decaying might be a visible signal. Okay, so what about spectral distortion of the CMB changes to that black body spectrum that I told you about? So again, let, let's just think about the, the energy density here. So suppose I told you that there were just that we had upper limits on the distortions of the spectrum at the level of about 10 to the minus five. So I take some energy from dark matter, I want to put it into distorting the CMB what kind of signal do I expect there? 
Well, so the radiation and matter energy densities were roughly equal when the universe was at redshift 3000. So in the present day, the radiation density is about 10 to the minus three of the matter energy density. And that's the lowest as far as we know that it's ever been. So what that means is that if I would liberate a one in a billion fraction of the mass energy. That means that like at best, even if that energy was all liberated today, at most, I would be putting in a distortion that was about 10 to the minus six of the energy stored in the radiation. And I told you the limit is 10 to the minus five. So this is this kind of tells you like, oh, hmm. and, and if I do this earlier in the universe's history, when radiation was relatively more important, this is going to be harder. So that tells me that while a one in a billion dark matter particles annihilating or decaying is a huge signal in ionization, it's actually a pretty wimpy signal in terms of distortions to the black body spectrum of the CMP. That doesn't mean it's totally undetectable. There are future experiments that could get to the sort of 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine distortion level, which could be able to see this, but it's a forecast for future experiments or it's a, um, or it's a way to look for signals that don't cause any ionization. What about changes to the gas temperature? So down to about redshift 200, the CMB and the gas are coupled in temperature. So that means if I want to heat up the gas, I have to heat up the CMB too. And then I run into the same issue that I ran into in the second point, that there's a lot of energy stored in the radiation field and it's hard to perturb it by very much. So you get the same estimate as the spectral distortion. Like if I put in one in a billion dark matter particles, mass energy, that's only going to change the temperature by at most one part in 10 to six. But below ratio of 200, the CMB becomes decoupled from the gas. The interactions aren't strong enough to keep them at the same temperature. So now, in principle, I can just heat the gas on its own and not worry about the CMB. That's what the stars do during reionization. So the baryon number density, so now I'm just saying, all right, um, the baryon number density is nine orders of magnitude smaller than the CMB number density, so it's much easier to heat. So if I say, OK, for each hydrogen atom, so that's one GeV of mass, I've got about five GeV of energy in dark matter. So let's suppose I liberated one, one billionth of that and it all went to heating the hydrogen gas. That would be about 5 EV per hydrogen atom. So what temperature is 5 EV per hydrogen atom? That turns out to be about 50,000 Kelvin. So, and recall that, you know, my estimated temperature of the universe after reionization was about 10,000 Kelvin. So again, like this is a really big signal. <laughs> um, so this sort of tells us that Ionization can be a really powerful probe of annihilation and decay for redshifts after recombination. You have to, you, the signal has to be occurring then because before that the universe was fully ionized, so you don't see a modification. The spectral distortion is more a way to probe physics at higher redshifts or processes that don't cause any ionization because it can't really compete head to head with ionization just on energetics grounds. Um, and the gas temperature change, you're not going to see effects from high redshifts because there you would have to heat the whole CMB as well, but it's potentially a large effect for redshifts less than about 200, and in particular could show up in 21 centimeter or line alpha observations. Okay, so this is sort of like, if you take one thing away from this colloquium, this is like all, all the physics. I'm gonna show you some results of the actual calculations what, to, to wrap up, but, but this is what's going on physically. And you know, we can do an example of what, so I've been saying, you know, one in a billion dark matter particles annihilating or decaying, okay, like what does that mean? How likely is that? Um, it turns out that for annihilation, this is enough to constrain that thermal relic benchmark that I told you about for dark matter masses lighter than about 10 GeV. For decaying dark matter, the calculation is even simpler. We can just ask, okay, if we want to know what's the fraction of dark matter decaying per e-fold in a given epoch, this is just telling us about the lifetime of the cosmos in that epoch divided by the lifetime of the dark matter, right? So if I can constrain a one in a billion fraction of the dark matter decaying when the universe was say 10% of its present age, which is the relevant thing for 21 centimeter. Uh, wait, sorry, did I? Sorry, that should be a billion, not hundred million. Sorry, miss. That up, then you know, then that would lead to limits on lifetimes of about 10 to the 8 times the age of the universe. Yes, yeah, sorry, I wrote this late at night. I evidently can't keep track of what is about. It should be a billion years. Um, so that would lead to lifetimes about 10 to the 8 times the age of the universe, which is a few times 10 to the 25 seconds. So from we don't have something heating the universe by 50,000 Kelvin when it was a billion years old, we expect to be able to set limits on the age of the universe of around 10 to the 25 seconds. Um, Similarly, so if we think about the CMB epoch, that happened when the universe was only order 10 to the six years old. Um, 
So if we can set a limit on a 10 to the minus 11 fraction of the dark matter decaying then, which was our estimate from annihilation, 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 12, then similarly we'd expect to get lifetime limits around a few times 10 to the 25 or 10 to the 26 seconds. And when you do the detailed calculation, that's what you find. This, this is a pretty good estimate. It's also, it's also worth noting that this also means that if you did have something that was not the dark matter, that you know, had lived for long enough to be present after the CMB was emitted and then decayed away, you can constrain really tiny metastable components of that form. Like you can constrain metastable components that have abundances 11 orders of magnitude smaller than the dark matter we see today. So that's, um, that's very well tested. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the physics basically. So that's the physics in my, so, so now in my remaining time, I'm just gonna say a little bit about how we actually do the calculation. Okay, so to study these effects in detail, you need to understand when you, sorry, were you putting up your hand, Eva? Because this is a good time. Yeah? No. Okay. I was just writing down a question. Okay, all right. Uh, I mean, like we could pause for a couple of questions now if people want, because that, that was like, that, that was the, everything I'm gonna show you from now on is just, here's how we actually calculate this and here are some results. Like that, that was the physics, con what I mostly showed you so far was the major physics content. Just, just go ahead. Okay, then I will, yeah. And I know we're, we're at the hour, so I will wrap up soon. But I actually, see we do have a question from somebody Betty. else. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Um, um, yeah, hi, um, just a quick question. Um, yeah. If I understand correctly, uh, what uh, you showed the 21 centimeter and the lime and alpha um, yeah. forest. So I understand that, uh, like, now you have two to six from lime and alpha forest, but you we probably we can't extend it to higher redshift, right? We all have to only do the 21 centimeter for the higher, um, much farther. Yeah, than that's, the, that's right. I think, right. I mean, I, I, think the, the, I think the issue there is it just gets completely saturated like if there was hydrogen it's you, you just find like yep there, there was a lot of hydrogen there the lime and alpha just got totally absorbed and that that's all you learn but yeah so it's a good question um yeah so so i think i mean this is part of the reason that people look at 21 centimeter because it's just a much weaker transition and so it doesn't saturate in the same way people are also doing other kind of um intensity mapping searches to look for other lines that aren't the lime and alpha line or the 21 centimeter line but i think the reason why people do uh, why there's a lot of focus on the 21 centimeter line is because it's a very weak transition and so it potentially allows you to look back um, a long way. So to, to, to times when there was a lot of neutral hydrogen and you want to be able to like actually measure the temperature, you, you want to be able to you know measure properties of that neutral hydrogen rather than just say, yep, there was a lot of neutral hydrogen, I guess it's 100%, I guess, you know, my, my photons are just 100% absorbed. Thanks. Okay, so so that's okay. So that's the physics. That's the back of the envelope stuff. To work this out in detail, though, you need to understand when you inject these particles into the, to the universe, how much of their energy actually ends up in ionization or heating or distortions. Now, I and other people have written various versions of code to do this, uh, starting back when I was a PhD student back in 2009. The latest version of this is a Python package called Dark History, which is publicly available on GitHub. You can all download it and play with it, which models how these particles lose their energy, how they produce secondary particles as the universe expands, accounting for the fact that some of these processes are pretty slow compared to the expansion of the universe. So you can't assume they're instantaneous. You have to take into account that you know, everything's redshifting while this particle production cascade is going on. And that allows for self-consistent treatments of both exotic and conventional sources of energy injection, i.e. you can use it when the stars turn on, um, which was a limitation of previous codes. So I'm just going to show you schematically what, what, this, what this looks like, and I'm happy to go into more detail for people who want it. But the basic signal pipeline here is that annihilation or decay or similar processes inject particles into the universe. If, we're, if they're unstable particles, like the W boson or something, the first step is you need to figure out what long-lived particles come out of this, because the decay lifetimes of all standard model particles are super short compared to the time scales that we're talking about here, which are hundreds of thousands of years and larger. So we just use Pythia or a similar program to figure out what spectrum of electrons, positrons, photons, neutrinos, et cetera, do you get? Uh, we throw out the neutrinos. We don't care about the neutrinos. There's maybe a signal of that in the cosmic neutrino background, but that's going to be very hard to see. 
Um, so then we focus on the electromagnetically interacting particles. For the results I'm going to show you, we also ignore protons and antiprotons because they tend to have a small branching ratio and they lose their energy a bit less efficiently than electrons and positrons. But it's possible the constraints I show you could get a little bit stronger if we included the energy deposition from protons and antiprotons as well. So that basically reduces the problem to if I've got something that injects high energy photons, electrons, and positrons into the universe, what happens to them? What do they do? So then we model the cooling processes for these particles, how they cool down, how they lose their energy, how they produce secondary particles, how many of them end up just free streaming. That gives us um, an amount of energy that gets absorbed into ionization and excitation and heating. And we need to use that to modify the evolution equations for the ionization and temperature history of the universe, which gets us the cosmic ionization and thermal histories. So what dark history does is this box. It assumes that you know, you're handing it some photons and electrons and positrons, and it will give you at the end a self-consistently computed modified ionization and thermal history for the universe. So what's going on inside it is we model a bunch of cooling processes for electrons and photons. So this is just atom this is atomic physics. This is not really um, high energy physics. So photons, they can pair produce on the cosmic microwave background. They can scatter off other photons. They can pair produce on the gas. They can Compton scatter at low energies. Um, photoionization becomes efficient. Uh, for a lot of these processes are kind of slow compared to the Hubble time. So you also have to take into account that the photons can free stream for a while and they can redshift during that free streaming. Some of these processes produce electrons or electrons and positrons can just be produced directly by the annihilation. So we need to understand what happens to them. For high energy electrons, they just inverse Compton scatter on the CMB. So they transfer their energy back to photons. So there's this cascade that goes back and forth between the electrons and photons involving pair production and inverse Compton at high energies. At low energies, the electrons can excite and ionize and heat the gas directly and the electron bar. Positrons behave like electrons at high energies, but at low energies, they're eventually going to annihilate on ambient electrons. And for electrons, pretty much all of these processes are fast relative to the Hubble time. So, you know, but, but some of their energy ends up in photons, which then you need to worry about their edge shifting. And the rates for this depend on, they depend on what time you're at, they depend on, so they depend on the redshift. Um, they also depend on how ionized the gas is, because this determines like how many free electrons there are to scatter off other electrons, and it somewhat affects the rates of power production. Okay, so what dark history does is computes all these processes self-consistently. It does so in the original version by it actually has it has a large number of pre-computed tables, which have a lot of these processes pre-computed in the original version um, for speed. And then having computed the amount of power ending up in heat and ionization and excitation of the gas, we solve these evolution equations. So these are evolution equations for the temperature of the matter in the universe as a function of time and the ionization level of hydrogen. We also include helium. That's a, that's a detail level thing, which ends up not mattering very much for the constraints. But we do include the effects of helium. The simplest treatment uses basically a three-level atom for the hydrogen atom, where you basically say, OK, the hydrogen atom's got a ground state. It's got a one excited state. And then you've got the continuum. And that, so that's the three-level atom. And so, so then we sort of, so then we, and, and by making those approximations, we get these relatively simple evolution equations. So these are the baseline terms that just correspond to the evolution that you would have in the absence of any kind of energy injection. Then you can add exotic energy injection terms. So here we see these modifications to the temperature and the ionization level that include these F heat and F iron and F EXC terms. These are just saying the fraction of the injected energy that goes into heating or ionization or excitation at a given time and it multiplies this DE dV dt, which is just the rate of power that you're injecting into the universe. So a sum level of what dark history is doing is computing these fractions, figuring out how much power goes into each channel, and then just solving this differential equation to figure out how the temperature and ionization level evolve. And you can also just add in additional sources of ionization and heating coming from, for example, reionization and stars, if, if you have a model for that. And this is all like you, you, you just tell it, you can give it extremely uh, arbitrary energy injections for the exotic component or the reionization component. So that's more or less what's going on inside. Again, I can give more detail if people want. It's provided with extensive example notebooks. Um, it can do very general energy injections. It doesn't need to be dark matter annihilation or decay, but we did provide examples for the cases of dark matter decay and annihilation because that's often what people are interested in. 
and we provided the injection spectra of electrons and positrons and photons that you get from annihilation to any standard model particle and its antiparticle just from Pythia. So these examples are showing the temperature and ionization histories that you would get as a result of uh, 50 GeV thermorelic dark matter annihilating the B quarks. The dashed line is what you would have with no energy injection. Um, so you can see that this is an example where we're sort of changing the hydrogen ionization level at the level of a few times 10 to the minus four and the temperature is getting kicked up by sort of like order 10 Kelvin at late times. Um, one of the options in dark history is to turn on or off back reaction effects. So back, by back reaction here, I just mean that if, the, if an earlier energy injection ionizes the universe more, that changes the gas ionization level and thus it changes how the particle production cascade proceeds. The pre-dark history codes all ignore this. They just said, well, yeah, let's assume that we're in the unperturbed universe um, when working out how the particle cascade proceeds. That's fine at early times. It becomes less fine once you go into reionization when there actually are really big changes to the ionization level of the universe consistent with experimental constraints. So the dark history turning these effects on or off is a matter of flipping one switch. So it's all incorporated. Okay, so that little advertising for our code package aside, just say, so you can, so what kind of constraints can you get from this? So this is an example of constraints of dark matter annihilation coming from ionization and observations of the CMB. It turns out that you can, you can work out the effect of this energy injection on the CMB, and it's basically universal up to an overall rescaling factor for dark matter ranging from KeV up to many TeV in mass. And so then that lets you say, all right, you, you just sort of like develop a template for here's how dark matter modifies the ionization history. Here's how that modified ionization history modifies the CMB. You hand that over to the Planck collaboration and say, can you put this template into your likelihood analysis and see if there's any evidence for it? And what they found was that there's no evidence for it. They set an upper limit on how strong that contribution, that signal of early energy injection could be. And that, and, and then you can translate that into a bound on the annihilation cross-section, depending on what kind of standard model particle the dark matter was annihilating to. So these different colored lines correspond to annihilation to different standard model final states. Um, the red line is annihilation straight to electrons or photons. All the other lines correspond to annihilation to other standard model particles like quarks or gauge bosons, so on. And um, everything but neutrinos. If you annihilate 100% of neutrinos, it's going to be very hard to see a signal from this. But for essentially, and this black dashed line is that thermorelic benchmark that I told you about. So what this tells us, the fact that this black dash line crosses the highest of these colored lines at about 10 GeV, basically, and, and we could continue this line with basically the same slope down to the KeV scale. So what that tells us is basically that the thermorelic benchmark, that picture where the dark matter is in thermal equilibrium with the standard model and then gets its abundance through depletion by annihilation, can basically be ruled out for masses below 10 GeV, with, with the caveats being unless there's a big branching ratio to neutrinos or unless there's an effect that suppresses the annihilation at late times. So like if you've got something that means that the dark matter was depleted in the early universe and then the annihilation turned off, then those models are still okay. But any model where the annihilation continued with a similar cross section to what it had in the early universe and you don't have a big branching ratio between neutrinos is just ruled out below 10 GeV. And of course, this also doesn't include models where the dark matter got its abundance from a completely different mechanism. So that's you know a pretty general statement about how dark matter behaves that you can get out of these constraints. You can do the same kind of thing for decaying dark matter. You currently get pretty comparable bounds, as you might have guessed from our back of the envelope estimates, from ionization and the CMB on one hand, or heating and the Lyman alpha forest on the other hand. Uh, I'll tell you that if we could get a 21 centimeter observation, which measured the temperature of the universe to be like tens of Kelvin at, um, at, at redshift 20, you could improve these constraints by about two orders of magnitude. Um, so this sets up, these lit cosmological bounds set some of the strongest limits on relatively light MeV to GeV dark matter, annihilating in a way that produces electrons and positrons. And as I said before, for short lifetime decays, you can rule out even 10 to the minus 11 of the dark matter decaying. So these, these lines here, the black line is a CMB an ionization base bound. The um, blue and red lines are bounds based on Lyman alpha and heating with different assumptions for the astrophysics. The blue line assumes that there are no stars and the only thing that heating the universe is dark matter. 
Um, so the blue line is where you can rule out dark matter even on that basis. The red lines in the orange band correspond to different levels of heating from the stars. And you can see sort of the, the lifetimes we're probing here, this is 10 to the 25 seconds. So our back of the envelope estimate was you could constrain lifetimes around 10 to the 25 seconds and at least for low mass dark matter, that, that's pretty accurate. This plot on the right is showing what happens if you have annihilation that is suppressed at late times, um, for example, because it's suppressed at low velocities. So that allows you to evade the CMB bounds um, on annihilation, but there are still some limits and the, and the limits there are stronger from light and alpha. From the CMB. So you can set these pretty generic limits on dark matter annihilating one. So I think I'm basically at the end of my time, but I'm, well, I'm actually 15 minutes over the end of my time. So I'll just sort of, sort, of, sort of finish up by saying a little bit about what we're doing now and, and what we're doing next. So the eventual goal that we'd like to have is just a map or a dictionary that allows you to say, all right, I've got some model for exotic energy injection in the early universe. What is the full set of signatures that it's going to produce and how detectable would they be? So we already have something really close to that for the um, ionization and CMB signals from dark matter annihilation and decay. Like we've worked out how to go from, you've got a dark matter model, which gives me an energy injection of the single template in the CMB that you can test. So we'd like to extend it to other observables and in particular to the Lyman alpha and 21 centimeter in preparation for the future 21 centimeter observations. So there are a lot of places that we could improve our original version. So we're using the dark history package as a basis for this. And there are a large number of things that we could do. So the first thing that we wanted to do was just uh, make the code more compact because we want relied on these really big pre-computed tables. Um, but you know, the, the current code sort of hard codes, the cosmological parameters, we'd like to be able to vary those so that we can you know, test the effects of dark matter marginalizing over the uncertainties in the cosmological parameters. The current version has a uh, kind of simplified treatment of low energy particles, which is partly why we don't show constraints for dark matter below the KEV scale. Um, the CMB spectral distortion, I gave you an argument that that's not currently a competitive signal, but it may be with future experiments. Um, the code doesn't uh, do that, the current version of the code doesn't do this accurately. Um, and if we could make the code faster, that would facilitate integration with other public code packages. Um, we'd like to, at the moment, the code treats the universe as homogeneous. This is fine at early times. It's probably not fine for the 21 centimeter signal where you want to look at the power spectrum of the 21 centimeter fluctuations. And, uh, the, and, and dark history also assumes that the only radiation field is the CMB. Again, that's going to be fine at early times. Once the stars turn on, it will eventually stop being fine. So Basically, everything above here is either done already or is going to be done in papers that I hope will be out within the next month or two. Um, so the first thing, the making the code more compact, uh, was basically that we taught a neural network to learn our giant interpolation tables. Uh, so again, I can say more about this if people are interested. This is part of work with the um, artificial with the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which IPI, which is a new institute based at MIT. And our goal here was basically just to store the transfer functions in a more efficient and compact way. Uh, a way to think of this is you know, bitmap images versus vector images. We were basically storing these large tables as a sort of evenly sampled grid of possibilities. But the image, but the transfer functions look something like this. Like they, they have structure, they have regions where they're smooth and regions where they're spiky. And an evenly sampled grid is kind of obviously not the most efficient way to store the information in, in a picture like this. So neural networks can serve as general function approximators. So we basically used a neural network as a sophisticated version of a fitting function to, to these tables. And I'm just gonna jump ahead. What you find is that in the new version of the code, which is based on the neural network instead of the transfer functions, this is what the results look like. So black is the original version of the code. Red is the neural network results for, um, this is for an example, this is for an example history for matter temperature, hydrogen ionization, helium ionization, distortions to the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. And you can see that the neural network does pretty well and it reduces the size of the tables by about three orders of magnitude. So that was, uh, that, that was, that was one recent development that we had in the latest version. The bigger project is the detailed treatment of how things work at low energies, which is at the moment um, pretty approximate. Again, happy to go into this in more detail, but I will just tell you that basically we're going from using a three-level atom treatment to using a um, to using a full multi-level atom treatment. 
we're tracking the interactions of the photons with the various atomic energy levels and um, where, yeah, and, and where, it's, yeah. so we're keeping a full track of what photons are produced and then how they interact with the atoms getting to the present day, tracking the excitation levels of hydrogen beyond just the first excited state and also just treating the pooling of low energy electrons and positrons better. And the payoffs for that are that we can get predictions for general energy injections to the full spectral distortion to the cosmic microwave background from pretty much any early energy injection. There have been some previous studies of this, but only from high red shifts in the fully ionized universe. Um, and we can also extend our constraints on decaying and annihilating dark matter accurately down to um, down to really low mass dark matter. So this is this is an example on the left for dark matter decaying into photons. The black line is the previously inferred constraint and the red line is the new constraint extending down to the down to the EV scale. Okay, so 15 minutes, 20 minutes over time. Sorry about that. But um, let me just wrap up and say the cosmological data sets can provide powerful probes of the non-gravitational properties of dark matter, as well as other exotic physics. This has allowed us to develop stringent and broadly applicable limits on annihilating attained dark matter, especially at sub-GV mass scales from the cosmic microwave background, as well as bounds from Lyman alpha on leptonically decaying light dark matter. We have a public numerical toolbox, dark history, to try to predict these early universe signatures of exotic energy injections. Um, our latest version is significantly more compact than the previous versions and will take up less space on your laptop when you have to download the giant tables. Um, and, and our hope is that this compact version will also facilitate future upgrades, such as including additional cosmological parameter dependence, understanding the effects of the inhomogeneity of the universe, and so on. And uh, we should have coming out soon some results that allow the full prediction of the low energy particle cascade, the resulting changes to the low energy spectrum of the cosmic microwave background and constraints on light dark matter. I'll stop there. Thank you all for putting up with my uh, somewhat extended talk. Uh, thank you so much for a nice presentation. Uh, now we'll go to questions. And um, the first question is from Yanis Siligakis. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tracy. I had, I had a question on the, on the training of the neural networks. Yeah. And you and you said you you uh, what kind of data do you train them on, and does this data come from like uh, the same uh, the same instruments or the same experimental setups, or do you mix them? So I I should yeah so so I should clarify we're we're actually in some ways we're sort of just like using the neural network as a large hammer for a not very big nail. You you could so. What we're doing at this point is this is not experimental data. This is basically just having the neural network learn stuff that we like learn our theoretical predictions so that we can store it in a more compact way. This is really like just conceptually akin to replacing this big table with a fitting function. It's just that the fitting function is a complicated fitting function built out of a neural network. So I mean, you, you can say in a sense that like this is sort of memorizing um, more than more than forecasting. Okay, so so. So that so that so that's sort of the that's what we're doing at this point. So we we can just check directly, do the neural network predictions adequately match what we originally put in? And the answer is like yes, they do. So so this is just a more compact way to store things that we already know how to compute. Now you could imagine, and we have talked um with people about doing something more uh about about doing something more complicated, like trying to teach well maybe complicated isn't the right word, but more ambitious, like trying to teach the neural network to go from an experimental data set, like the CMB data set or a bunch of temperatures to jump from that straight to here is the constraint on a set of dark matter models, or, or maybe like, uh, or, or a little less ambitious than that, trying to go from um, given some random energy injection model, like here is my final ionization and temperature history, which are then gonna be the observables that feed into the data. Um, but at the moment, what we're doing is not that, it's less ambitious than that. We're just asking the neural network to learn basically how the particle cascade works at every redshift, um, which can then be used to, uh, which can then be used to predict the ionization and thermal history. But, but I mean, I think it is, so, so yeah, so, so at that level, like the experimental data, it, isn't relevant at this stage. This is just 
this is just learning how to make a theoretical, learning how to replicate a theoretical prediction. But, um, but, but you could try to do those more ambitious things and that might make the code much faster. Like, I mean, it's, it's quite possible that we're sort of doing, doing steps which take an unnecessary amount of time here. And that is something that we could follow up on. But at the moment, we're not doing that. We're just learning a table. Does that, does that help? Does that make sense? Yes, yes, thank you. That, 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 was, that was quite, uh, uh, yeah, I, I understood that. Now, when do you plan to use, to, to start that collaboration to, to, uh, to, to integrate CMB data to kind of teach the neural network how the, what is the real physics, let's see, at least according to our instruments, and then try to see you know, what, what does it learn and then how does it compare it with the theoretical prediction? That's what I thought the... Uh, yeah, no, so so at, at the moment, this is just making, this is just making a less, making a theoretical prediction code that involves less obnoxiously large tables. Like that's, that was the only goal of this step. Um, so for some of the CMB constraints, I think the neural network stuff is probably overkill because the thing that you learn just by doing something simpler like a principal component analysis is that essentially all dark matter, well, okay, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but the thing that you learn is like all dark matter annihilation models look completely identical in the CMB up to um, like up to an overall rescaling factor. So basically your multi-dimensional space of dark matter models collapses down to a one-dimensional parameter space to a really good approximation. Like you, you can do this with principal component analysis. You find that the variance associated with the second principal component is like the first principal component is 99.97% of the variance. So like you, to, to be able to measure deviations from that first principal component, you would need to be seeing the first principal component at like 100 sigma. So that kind of tells you, all right, for that signal, like the neural network is overkill. There really is just kind of one template that you can look for in the CMB and we know what that template looks like. Now, that's not true for totally generic energy injection. So that assumes that you've got a dark matter annihilation like signal, which means that the signal scales like density squared as a function of redshift. And, and so that like that imposes a one plus e to the six scaling, which is which is pretty strong. So so you could imagine trying to teach a neural network how to look for signals of a like generic redshift dependent energy injection into the CMB and then ask if there's any evidence for like a for, for, for some kind of generic energy injection into the CMB, not just one that necessarily looks like dark matter annihilation or decay. Um, that would be interesting. I, I haven't thought about doing that, but um, but yeah, it, so so I think for dark matter annihilation, it, it it would be redundant. The neural network would just learn that all models look identical, but um, but like identical up to a rescaling factor. But but more generally, yeah, maybe that would be interesting. Thanks. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um. I'll, I'll, I have a question of my own. Uh, at some point, you mentioned that so far you didn't implement the role of the magnetic field in this uh, simulations. So I could imagine that the magnetic field messes up quite a bit with the uh, thermalization, and in fact, maybe even like switching off some of the processes at the end of the evolution. Is that what you have in mind, or there are maybe some subtle effects that uh, that has yeah, to be taken? So, so the reason that we don't have the B field in there at the moment is that we, as far as I know, we don't really have very good constraints on what the primordial magnetic field should be. Like there are, there are some upper limits, but the upper limits are probably still consistent with having a non-negligible B field at early times. So it's just, but, but yeah, so it's an interesting question because I mean, if you did have a substantial energy density in, in a magnetic, in a magnetic field at early times, there would be a, certainly additional energy loss processes like you, you could imagine that synchrotron radiation producing much lower energy photons would give you an additional distortion to the CMB and that could actually be faster than some of the other processes that we're thinking about like there are regions of parameter space where we say oh all these energy loss processes you know like are not super fast compared to other time scales we care about well maybe if you have a B field that that's no longer true so and and for and for thinking and in particular for sorry so right so provided that the B field has an energy density much less than the CMB at early times, which I think we expect to be true, then it I would guess that it 
probably is not going to have a huge effect on on quantities like how much total power ends up in heating or how much total power ends up in ionization just because um you know like in the, if if it's true that most of the energy that there's a lot more energy density in the CMB than in the B field, then the electrons will primarily lose their energy through inverse Compton, not through synchrotron. And so then I expect the electron evolution to look fairly similar to what it does. But the place where I think it could, I mean, that's my intuition. My intuition might be wrong on this, but but the place where I would expect it to potentially have a big issue is that this produces a new way to distort the CMB at low frequencies, which at the moment just like isn't in the code at all. And so at the moment we expect basically no positive distortion below the peak of the CMB in energy. And as soon as you turn on magnetic fields, I think that's no longer true. I think it can populate that, that region. Mm -hmm. so, so that's like one example of the place where including a primordial magnetic field as a possibility might, might give you qualitatively different results. But yeah, the, the reason that, and, and but you're also right that like at the end of the evolution, um, it, it doesn't need to be a primordial magnetic field anymore, right? Like once all of this is happening inside galaxies, the galaxies have magnetic fields and maybe you have to worry about that. So yeah, that that starts to get into my like, oh, like galactic astrophysics is complicated. Um, and one of the reasons for doing these cosmological probes is that to they, they let you look at the early universe where some of the physics is much simpler, but certainly at the end point of this evolution, you start to get into just present day indirect detection constraints from looking at galaxies. And there, especially for charged particles, people do think carefully about what is the magnetic field. And it's one of the major uncertainties and constraints on um, dark matter that annihilates electronically. Like you have these charged electrons and positrons, they need to propagate through the galactic magnetic fields. What are the galactic, the galactic magnetic fields determine both like how much energy they lose to synchrotron and how they diffuse. So what the spatial distribution of the signal looks like. And, and then there are significant uncertainties associated with what's, with what's going on in those, in those B fields. So, so yeah, at the end of the evolution, the B fields are gonna be important. Early in the evolution, the B fields might be important. My guess is that the way in which they would be most important is our spectral distortion predictions might not be accurate. I see, I see, thank you. Any other questions from yeah, the if, audience? If you have like a good constraint on primordial B fields, that, that would be great to know. I thought there were some constraints from the um, this um, uh, gamma radiation that is coming through the uh, intergalactic voids. And I believe they were yeah. giving the limit from uh, below, if I'm not wrong. Okay, I let me, if, if you set, send me the reference for this, because I've, I've seen a lot of upper limits. I'm not sure I've seen a lower limit that I really believe, but I would be excited to see. I think this limit. there is this famous paper by Neronov and Volk uh, about oh, yeah. 10 years ago, uh, I believe Nature yeah, I'll, or something. I'll, I'll take a look, but the, there's also, I mean, there's also a question of like how how early is early? Like, I mean, some, some of our constraints are coming like people talk of, sometimes people talk about the early universe in mean redshift two and sometimes people talk about the early universe in mean redshift a thousand and sometimes people talk about the early universe in mean well, redshift a billion. they're not talking about the early universe by the way they are talking about the voids and since the magnetic in the voids yeah. have basically little okay. uh possible uh and then they scenarios to develop so they basically associated with the yeah. okay. primordial okay good yeah no i'll i'll take a look Thanks. okay uh, so any other questions uh, from the audience? I think I had some questions, but apparently, uh, yeah, there was another question, but you almost answered it. Maybe I'll ask it anyway. Um, you were basically saying that MOND uh, theories are not most favorable. And frankly, I I sort of think I understood the, the reasoning you were saying, but I want to rephrase it. Is it kind of like excluded possibility or you still think that it's not completely excluded? I don't think it's excluded. So um, there have been some attempts recently to formally exclude MOND and MOND-like theories by looking at the distribution of stars in our galaxy. And um, the, but from what I have seen of those, the exclusions are generally weak. Like they, they find that MOND is disfavored, but it's disfavored with the significance of like, one to two sigma so that like that that's not an exclusion right i mean we we, we would never believe an exclusion of one or two sigma um so so you know i i think like there is maybe a little bit of experimental evidence that at least the simplest version of one doesn't do as well as dark matter in explaining galaxies but i mean the bigger challenge to 
mond and mon life theories has traditionally been that it's very hard to explain the full suite of cosmological observables that are relatively easily explained by, by adding dark matter. But I mean, but that's not necessarily a, I mean, but, but, but that, I mean, that, that just may mean that we haven't found the right theory yet. I mean, I, I guess my, yeah, my personal feeling is that, you know, like the bet, the bet that I have made is that it's probably dark matter just because it seems like it seems like the Occam's razor solution. Like we've got something that looks really consistent with just being a new component that has an equation of state that looks like ordinary matter and that stuff like, okay, that's that's simple, that's boring. I'm, I'm guessing that that is likely their answer, but Occam's razor isn't always the right guideline, right? I mean, like there are certainly things where the universe appears to be significantly more complicated <laughs> than we would have guessed based just on an Occam's razor argument. So I like I think it is a good thing that there are people still thinking about theories where gravity is modified in the in the IR that might be consistent with the data and might be able to explain the behavior in cosmology and astrophysics that we typically attribute to dark matter. Like I I I don't I don't think that like we can say it's impossible that that would be the solution. Um, but I, I think that the work of many people has demonstrated that it is rather hard to get a complete solution. I, I, I did see a, a paper not that long ago that claimed to do a better job of getting the CMB right, which, which is really, which is important. And so, you know, that's, that's very interesting, but it's still, it still to me seems like getting the cosmology right in that style type of model seems to be like pretty hard and the theories you need are sometimes pretty broke and you often need to introduce a component that behaves basically like dark matter anyway right. which doesn't mean it's wrong like I, again like I'm, I'm glad that people are still thinking about it but for me personally dark matter seems like a simpler explanation of what we're seeing so. right 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 yeah i i guess that that's a very reasonable point to consider right now. Okay, um, any other questions from the audience? I don't see any raised hands, so let me use this opportunity to thank our speaker, uh, Tracy, uh, for this very nice presentation.